Praise the Lord. Tonight I want to deal with the life in the Spirit. I'm going to be dealing basically with the principle of Galatians 2.20, being crucified with Christ. Tonight I want to deal with moving beyond the threshold. And the Lord has given me a series of messages on the deeper life in the Spirit, which is the title of one of the books here at Faith Assembly. Shortly after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Lord gave a vision. I happened to be counseling with a family at the time, deciding whether or not they were going to be missionaries. The decision was go by faith or by board. And that's a decision whether or not you're going to be a missionary, which choice you make. Otherwise, you're a paid employee. But I saw them in this vision, this family, enter what seemed to be a big southern mansion, that type of house. They stepped in the doorway over the threshold, and everybody just stopped except the husband. And there was an apparatus that would take you up to the second floor that looked kind of like a ski lift. See, God can work out the visions the way he wants. I don't think you'd find one of those in a house, but he was showing me something, and the husband, as soon as he stepped through the threshold, the whole family stopped, but he didn't stop. He just took another step and grabbed hold of that. Didn't sit down or anything, just held on, went all the way to the top. His wife said, why did you do that? He said, because I wanted to. Then the Lord showed me how that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is just a threshold experience, the doorway to something deeper, the deeper life in the Spirit, and the baptism is only that, and how that most people stop once they enter that spiritual dimension. They just stop there. Well, now I've got the baptism and I'm all set. And those who go deeper or higher do so because they want to. Why did you do that? Because I wanted to. People have come to faith assembly, visitors occasionally, and like one girl said, well, why do you people study so? Carry Bibles and take notes. Well, the same answer. Because they're going deeper with God. Why are they doing this? Because they want to. Now, if you don't, it's because you don't want to, I assume. Now, what is the deeper life in the Spirit? Well, summed up, it is living the crucified life. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Matthew 16.24, where Jesus said, If any man come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. And then in another passage, he said, Daily, take it up daily. Now in our book, The Deeper Life in the Spirit, we have several chapters, chapters like The Purpose of the Deeper Life, chapter on the pathway to the deeper life. We deal with the principles and practice of the deeper life. But it's interesting, if you start where you're supposed to in a book, the first chapter is preparation for the deeper life, which is how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and why most Christians don't have it, and we list the stumbling blocks and how to remove them. And of course, here's where all the confusion is. The institutional church believes and teaches that you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you're saved without new tongues today. And because they don't have the threshold experience, then they can't go on deeper or higher. But you know, charismatics are not immune from a lot of confusion because there's considerable among charismatics. Some hold that, well, while they personally receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, not all have to and not all do. And of course, that just leaves confusion to say nothing else. It's out of line with the Word of God. The prophecy in the Old Testament in Joel, compare that with Acts 2. When they heard them speaking in tongues, they said, what meaneth this? And then he quoted the Old Testament prophecy. It's out of line with the New Testament. Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19, and I believe also Acts 8. It implies that they spoke in tongues there. And of course, since they always do, we know they did, but we can't prove it by saying it's verse 13. But we know they spoke in tongues. 
And then out of your own experience, out of my experience, countless hundreds, I've quit counting a long time ago. It was interesting when you got your first hundred you prayed for, that received. But countless hundreds, I have never seen one single individual receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the threshold experience, without the initial evidence of new tongues. Not a one. You'd think you'd hear one. And then there's the view I read recently by a spirit-filled brother I've even spoken in his church years ago. And I didn't know he believed this, but it just confuses people. He teaches that when you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. By the way, I don't want to digress, but so many people can't seem to separate between regeneration and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're two different experiences. They think if you receive the Holy Spirit, that's regeneration. Or if you're regenerated, that's the baptism. But anyway, he said when you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit, and if you would just yield your tongue, he would give you new tongues, and that is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's very subtle, but it's a subtle deception. Because most people have been in church for years when they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that's saying all along, and that is what he's saying, that all one would have to do is to start talking and he'd be baptized in the Spirit. The speaking in tongues is the baptism. Because he says that's proof that the Holy Spirit is within. We see that doesn't line up with the Word of God because the Holy Spirit always, without exception, comes from without. The disciples on the day of Pentecost did not yield their tongues to the Holy Spirit within because it hadn't been yet given. We're told in John 7 the Holy Spirit is not yet because it had not yet been given. And in John 14, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is with you and he shall be in you. And then in Acts chapter 10, we're told that the Holy Spirit fell upon the Gentiles. You see, He always comes from without when you're baptized in the Spirit. He fell on the Gentiles. Why did He have to fall on them if He's within them? Because they had already obviously believed the gospel and were regenerated. And so, in order to move beyond the threshold experience, you have to have that experience. And you can't receive the threshold experience as long as you believe that you already have it as the non-charismatic church teaches and believes, or as many charismatics believe, how are you going to receive the Holy Spirit if you believe you can receive it without any evidence, the initial evidence, and so on. So how do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, that's the first chapter of the Deeper Life book, but summed up, it means to accept the fact that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience that you must ask for, ask for, by faith, subsequent to salvation. That means after. Contrary to what the church teaches today, and many charismatics believe, the baptism of the Holy Spirit to receive it is an experience you have to ask for in faith. And it's after you're saved. You're not baptized as soon as you're saved. If you just start talking, you'd be talking in tongues. That doesn't make any sense at all. Because the Holy Spirit comes from without. Luke eleven thirteen. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that are saved, to them that have needs, to the Christians? No, he says, to them that ask Him, they'll get the Holy Spirit. You have to ask. I thought for 14 years I had it until I asked for it, and then I got it. And then I saw what I got was not what I had been telling people I had. It was a lot better, by the way. In fact, I have seen, I don't know how many people who thought they had the experience without the evidence of new tongues, receive the baptism with tongues when they were taught they didn't have it because, you know, their creed said they did, that it's an experience they'll know when they get it. No one will ever have to wake you up and say, hey, don't you know you've received the baptism? I heard you talk in tongues in your sleep. You'll be the first to know it when you're baptized in the Spirit. Then the second thing is to receive the Holy Spirit. After you ask, is act on your faith. After you ask in faith, act on your faith. Expect the Holy Spirit to give you new tongues, to give you the evidence, expecting to. I waited three weeks for the Holy Spirit to speak through me, and then I would know I was baptized in the Spirit. I went all the way to Chicago to a full gospel businessmen's meeting in 1966. I was prayed for, still nothing. 
But I was desperate by that time. Three weeks is a long time for faith to have to wait. When it's faith, it doesn't wait three weeks. But the point is, when you get around to exercising faith, it'll happen. So I said, in effect, Lord, I've come all the way to Chicago. I've done all I know to do. Made restitution. Done all the things you don't do. Fasted, prayed, pounded on the bed, getting real energetic and enthusiastic and zealous. So I said, I believe I have received. I just had prayer 30 minutes ago or whatever. And I kept still waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak. And I had read somewhere where there will be syllables of an unknown language often float up into your consciousness and you'll think it's something in your head. At that point it is. So that you'll have sense enough to speak forth what he's given you. And I got, I think it was Lama Dhamma Dai. I don't know what it means in whatever language. Lama Dhamma Dai. And I said that just about that dry <laughs> for a full minute. Then I mean it happened. You don't have to have my experience, but the Holy Spirit literally took my tongue. Now, I was a cardiac patient at the time. Divine healing, by the way, came right with that, but the Holy Spirit literally lifted me up and my arms went in the air and I haven't stopped speaking yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now all of that up to this point, you say, what's that have to do with a deeper life? Everything. Because up to this point, we've shown those who do not have the threshold experience, they'll not go deeper with God. Oh, saved, yes. We're talking about the spirit life, the spirit-led life. That's what he's called us to, not called us to exercise faith and put a period there. But everything is toward the crucified life. And he has ways of crucifying you if you will yield to him. So up to that point, it's addressed to those primarily who do not have the threshold experience or thought they did, and now they know they didn't. And you can receive any time. I mean, you wouldn't be the first to receive in your seat if you'd simply believe God. I told you you didn't have to wait three weeks already. You don't have to go that route just because I did. We've had people receive in their seats. Well, now I see that it's just asking and believing in faith and giving to God in praise what the Holy Spirit gives me, whether I understand it or not. If you understand it, it wouldn't be supernatural anyway. Or you can receive by the laying on of hands. I mean, you couldn't get up here if you just ask your neighbor. But if nobody prays for you before you got up here, why, you come believing after the message and you'll receive. You can't go deeper with God without it. And there are people who get into services like this without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It happens all the time. Now, what the deeper life is and how you enter into it and appropriate it is set forth in the book in much detail, and there are many, many tapes. So tonight, I want to deal with aspects that we haven't dealt with, and that is things that will hinder you from moving beyond the threshold, because 99% of you have the threshold experience hinder you from moving beyond it, or if you have, that will retard your spiritual growth. Certain hindrances. Now these are things that are addressed to your spirit, not your head and not to entertain, but addressed to your spirit. And if you receive them, then the Lord will implant in your heart a seed from the various truths set forth tonight that will blossom forth. Things will just begin to happen if you let it. So many people come to church and they listen to a sermon. Well, I was blessed by that. Hallelujah. It was a message on faith or deeper life or whatever. But that isn't the purpose. Purpose is to take these seeds and let them sink deep into your spirit, into your heart. And the Holy Spirit will start bringing them forth out there when you need them. You know, when you yield to the Spirit rather than telling that person where they're wrong, that's easy to do because you're smarter than they are, especially on spiritual matters. So it's easy to get people straightened out and get yourself all messed up. So the first hindrance thing you want to watch out for, one common deterrent to spiritual growth, is expecting the Holy Spirit to do for you what God expects you to do for yourself. Now this will become clear as we get into it. I assume a lot of you at least have read the Deeper Life book. 
And in one part of it, we stress the absolute necessity of learning to yield to the Holy Spirit. That's the secret. That's the key to the deeper life. You yield to the Spirit of God in everything. Your whole life is yielding to Him. Your decisions, in your attitudes. You just give in to the Spirit. And of course, as we show you in the book, the question is sometimes raised, well, how do I yield? What do I do to yield to the Spirit? And as we answer in the book, nothing. And so you can close the book and no, that isn't what we said because the rest of that particular section will show you what doing nothing means because it's an attitude. It's the absence of self-will. It's seeking, as Jesus did, only to do God's will. Yielding is not doing something. It's the absence of resistance. And you'd be surprised how much you resist the Holy Spirit. People will read Acts chapter 7, how the Jews resisted the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do ye. How many would want to stand before the judgment bar tonight and before any charges would be read of your works, say, I've never resisted the Holy Spirit, rebelled against? There's so many ways you do because when he's trying to teach you something, say, eradicate root and branch some error in doctrine and that is such a part of you and you're thinking back from the old denominational system or something you picked up on your own because after all you can study for yourself you say to yourself and he wants to root that out it's so painful whatever it is the Matthew 28 19 triune formula admitting to yourself that acts is the way they carried out that commission in the name of Jesus and so they resist the Spirit on the doctrine of water baptism. That's just one thing. And so yielding is not doing something. It's the absence of resistance when the Holy Spirit convicts you about some habit, some error in doctrine, when he wants to lead you to a closer walk with Jesus and it's going to cost you something like a right arm. Yeah, it'll cost you. You'll think it's a right arm or a left leg because the cost is so great. And so resisting the Holy Spirit because of the cost. Yielding is not resisting when he wants to separate you from some worldly friend or worldly associations you've got at work or your golf partner or whatever. You can excuse a lot with a golf club. Well, I can talk to him about Jesus. Well, do you? And of course, you can apply it to radio or whatever. I'm just saying that he may want to sever some of your old worldly relationships that you thought were innocent, and eventually you'd lead that person to the Lord. You know how that goes. It's not resisting when he wants you to give up some practice that's hindering your spiritual growth or when he wants you to experience some trial of your faith. Oh, anything but that, Lord. I mean, I've been sitting under the faith message now, lo, these nine years, or five, or three, or four, or ten, or whatever it is, and I need to learn some other lessons. No more trials of faith, not for a while anyway. It's not resisting when he wants you to give up something that is dear to you, because you're showing too much affection toward it, giving too much attention to it. This is what it means to yield to the Spirit. It's like when you see the red flashing lights and hear the siren on the state trooper's car and you're in the lane where he's trying to get through. What do you do in yielding to him? You don't do anything. You get out of the way. You just don't resist. And this is what it means in every area of your life. Yielding in such matters is just not resisting whatever God is trying to speak to you about through his word, through conscience, through circumstances. Now up to that point, we've been explaining what yielding is, its passive side. And here's where it can become a hindrance if you're not careful. 
Such yielding must not become an excuse for inactivity on your part. Though yielding is passive, it's not doing anything, yet you do have to pull the car over to the curb. There's some activity involved. In other words, yielding does not imply inactivity. Some say, well, I've yielded my life to the Holy Spirit. I've claimed victory over, well, say, anger, pride, impatience, cigarette habit, whatever. I've yielded my total life to the Holy Spirit, and sometimes I fail in these areas. Now, why doesn't it work for me like it does for others? It just may be because you look upon yielding as inactivity. Yielding does not imply inactivity. For example, Galatians 5.16, Paul says, walk in the Spirit. Now, that's certainly the same thing as saying, live the crucified life. Take up the cross or whatever. To the extent you yield to the Spirit, it will happen. But you notice you have to walk. And walk implies obedience to whatever God has said. Walk in the Spirit. So it doesn't imply inactivity. And when Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, let a man deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me, there are three activities involved. There are three things he said you are to do. And so while yielding has its passive side, it's the absence of resistance to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life or show you or how he wants to lead you or correct you or change you, yet it doesn't imply inactivity. To give you an example, let's say that you and your spouse had a rather lengthy, I won't say heated, but strong discussion over a matter, or it may have been with your employer, and then later the Holy Spirit showed you you were wrong and they were right, whoever it was. Now, yielding to the Holy Spirit is yielding your pride and saying, Lord, I was wrong. I ask you to forgive me. But you see, unless you're careful, you'll fall into the snare of thinking yielding is just telling something to God in prayer, yielding that you were wrong, but not doing anything about telling the person you were wrong or apologizing, or making restitution. But so many, when they go to prayer, they'll say, Lord, I see I'm wrong. Now, I ask that the Spirit of God will just work out this problem. I made a mess out of it. I'm going to yield to the Holy Spirit. Let Him work it out. Well, see, that's the passive side, and it's good for you to ask for forgiveness. But the Holy Spirit may want you not only to pray, but to say, to go to that person and say, I was wrong. See, yielding then would have its active side. It's very easy to ask the Holy Spirit to straighten out your messes. Sometimes he's the only one, I understand. And we're not talking about every little situation arises. You run up and say, well, I had a wrong thought about you, Brother Freeman. That doesn't edify. I don't want to hear that. I'm just using as an example how that it's so easy to yield to the Holy Spirit and admit you're wrong and ask God to forgive you and then ask him to work it out. You see, there's an active side to yielding, not just a passive side. First of all, we're saying that we must not expect the Holy Spirit to do for us what He wants us to do for ourselves. Secondly, be sure that it's the Holy Spirit that you're yielding to and not some other spirit. Now, some are hindered in their spiritual growth because... They're yielding to some other spirit than the Holy Spirit, though they think they're yielding to the Spirit of God. Sometimes it's their own spirit. It's easy to yield to a wounded spirit, tell somebody off, say, that was the Holy Spirit, really got them straightened out. So it may be your spirit, it may be a strong controlling spirit in another person. Some people are being controlled by other people, a strong spirit. Or it could be the spirit of the enemy, and not the Holy Spirit. And all the while, you think it's the Holy Spirit. You think that isn't possible? You ought to be in the pastor's role for a while, and you just stand in amazement and wonder, how could they be so gullible? They thought that was the Holy Spirit, because everything obviously was against it. Like the woman, this is years ago, somewhere where I was speaking, a nun, charismatic nun, 
and we won't go into that. We'll just say what it was at the time. You have to come to a balance, you know. If you mention this or that, then you have to explain all of the things about what you don't mean or what didn't happen and all that. You'd never get through. But anyway, she had gotten a hold of the Angels of Light book on deliverance from our cult. And she said, I practice yoga. A lot of nuns and Catholics do this, among others. She was practicing yoga. And she said, I actually thought, you know, this was yielding to the Spirit of the Lord because I had the Lord on my mind and going through all these meditations and exercises until she said, strangest thing, it just happened out of the blue, a spirit of lust took possession and began to attack me. Now, we've got things like this in the book Every Wind of Doctrine, as well as Angels of Light, by the way, where it's not only possible, but it happens. It happens more times than we mention in the book that we've dealt with. Some are so weird that you couldn't put them in a book. But anyway, she thought, she said, I was yielding to the Holy Spirit. And there she was yielding to that unclean spirit, which any occult spirit is unclean. Another woman in a meeting thought she was yielding to the Holy Spirit working through a minister through the laying on of hands, and she became possessed because he had a spirit of divination. I mean, people will stand in line to get men who call themselves ministers, men or women, to lay hands on them. That's just a common fact. I trust by now there's no one that gullible in this body. We've taught enough on it. But in another case up north a little ways where... A young woman was in a Catholic charismatic meeting several years ago, and a clothed figure, clothed in a monk's robe, laid hands on her, and that's the last she remembered. She ended up, I mean immediately, a total mentally insane person. I've told you this before. They sent for a prayer cloth anointed by our prayers, and she was instantly set free after spending some time in a mental institution, instantly set free and restored to normal. But the laying on of hands. People think they're yielding to the Holy Spirit. And not a few out of this body have not heeded the warnings that we've given again and again in 1 Timothy 4.1. That in the latter days some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits the doctrines of demons. You know, they think that's something back in the first century or way out in some cult, and they've actually fallen victim to it here and then carried away disciples who themselves were deceived, and some of them still believe that that's the Holy Spirit speaking through some of those men because they follow them. I'd be afraid to go to sleep at night following some of these little adolescents and self-appointed evangelists. <sighs> they thought and think they're following the Holy Spirit. I was teaching several years ago in a meeting where a man came to me after the teaching session, this way back in the 60s. He said, the Holy Spirit told me that there was a man in this city coming in and teaching. I was to sit under his ministry. He gave me a sign to identify him that couldn't be missed. Whatever it is, is nobody's business. It could be, he'll be wearing a red and blue tie and a white jacket and a blue coat. That would pretty well identify you. I don't think anybody else would meet that test. Not if they're teaching anyway. There's just one of us up here. <laughs> anyway, he gave a sign and said, when I saw the sign, I nearly flipped. And he began to relate rather heavy supernatural experiences. And then for the next couple of meetings, he would come up after and relate these things to me, how the Holy Spirit would catch him away, transport him to Palestine and show many wonderful things, you know, about what God was doing and getting ready to do, and visions and revelations. But as I listen, you know, I don't always throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I do listen. If you're talking, I listen. Why should I be talking? Amen. If it's important enough to say something to me, I listen. I really do. Amen. I can be looking for somebody, and I say, go ahead, I'm listening. I really am. But anyway... As I listened, I began to detect an occult taint. Then it got stronger. You know, things, Edgar Casey and spiritualism, and oh, I said, wait a minute, about third meeting, I said, you're deceived. You know, if God sets you in here, it's to get delivered. 
really, if the Holy Spirit sent him to begin with, is to get delivered. But I think it was another spirit to try to ensnare me because all these meetings after the teaching session. I said, this is a deceiving spirit. You better get delivered of that. Oh, well, he resisted that. Never showed up again. Well, if God told him, sit there, doesn't make any sense. But anyway, he thought, and still to this hour, thinks that's the Holy Spirit. Because it's easy to think that. Free rides to Palestine, <laughs> caught up into the third heaven, all sorts of revelations. Why, half the people you know would give their eye teeth for just one such experience. So make sure it's the Holy Spirit you're yielding to. It's easy to yield to these spirits of revelation and delusion. We've seen it happen here. And then sometimes, I said, you're yielding to your own spirit, and you think it's the Holy Spirit, or you want to. To use an example that I suggested in time of your being reviled or mocked for your beliefs, falsely accused, you revile back. Give them word for word. Of course, you're giving it from the Word of God, but you give them word for word. <laughs> and you defend yourself and justify yourself. You, spiritually speaking, leave them speechless. But you see, in cases like that, generally, you're not yielding to the Holy Spirit, but to your own wounded spirit. It's very easy to defend yourself and call it righteous indignation. Oh, how the Lord gave me such wisdom that I left them speechless. But if you really get honest with yourself, you were yielding to your own wounded spirit and soothing that and calling it the Holy Spirit inspiring you. Well, I can tell the way some of you look, that would never happen to you. Not until tomorrow, at least. I mean, don't look like it wouldn't happen to you. Probably already has, so why are you looking that way? A woman wrote me a letter how she said, I've been studying the deeper life in the Spirit. And I had a chance, really, to exercise it, yielding to the Spirit, what she was talking about. She said, in this establishment where I work, a man came in. He had misunderstood when he would get his goods delivered back to him. And when they weren't ready, and he was at fault, she said, he literally took me apart with a tongue lashing. Just raged, raged, literally yelled and screamed and raged. And she said, I knew it was an opportunity to yield to the Holy Spirit. So I didn't utter one syllable. In the middle of all that raging, he finally stopped and settled down enough to say, aren't you going to answer me? Aren't you going to defend yourself? Justify yourself? Aren't you going to say anything? She said, no. And she said he couldn't say another word. Speechless. Now, there's a case where you leave your enemies speechless, not by giving them a piece of your spirit, but yielding your spirit to the Holy Spirit. I mean, what can people say about you if you don't answer them back? That's why I keep telling you, I don't want to know what people say. I don't want to know because, you know, if I don't say anything, then they can't misquote me. Be sure that you stay fully yielded to the Holy Spirit every day of your life, so that in time of trial, you don't yield to your own spirit. Now, I'm talking to all of you on this, all of us. Oh, it's so easy. They're so wrong. I've got to get them straightened out. Some people, you know, love to get others straightened out on the faith and presumption question or JDS question, speaking in tongues question, to the extent they grab them by the lapels, you know, and try to argue them into faith or write letters to editors and whatever. Well, it may soothe your spirit, but it's not going to accomplish much, if anything. Probably be detrimental. Then there's another area, yielding to the Spirit, in the operation of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 12, he speaks of all the various gifts. Now, often you'll see these in operation where the Holy Spirit anoints to prophesy, tongues interpretation, a word of knowledge. He often anoints for that. Not just the leader, but people in the body, as you know. But sometimes, when the anointing isn't present, it's not unknown for an individual to try to force the operation of some gift, 
like you have a mental blur real quick and you say, well, that's a word of knowledge. The Spirit isn't operating, but you try to force the operation, say, of a word of knowledge, and then nobody responds to that, or if they do, it doesn't work. Or in prophecy, there's no anointing there, but you've been used by God in prophecy before. You're not anointed in this case. It's not the Holy Spirit, and so the prophecy comes out of your own spirit. Not necessarily false in the sense you're a false prophet. Of course, you were, that would be detected soon enough. But prophecy in the flesh, in your own spirit. The Old Testament speaks of prophets who spoke out of their own heart, who related prophecies out of their own dreams, who prophesied visions out of their own heart. Now that's interesting, that you can have a vision that you conjure up. You so want to be used tonight, then you're just struggling. Lord, just show me. I'm submitted to the Spirit, and so on. And then you have this flash from too many hamburgers the night before. You have this <laughs> flash, whatever you think it means in the Spirit. And you say, somebody's here with a broken right arm. Well, obviously, if they're here with a broken right arm, we'll know that that one worked out. But they'll give some abstraction, somebody here with pain in their left side. I know that's valid. That happens. I'm talking about when the anointing is and there. Prophets in the Old Testament would force prophecies forth and say, Thus saith the Lord. And what it does, it deceives and misleads. And so we can't yield to our spirits in cases like this it's better not to have a prophecy or a word of knowledge, and certainly we have those all the time here. It's better not to have them than to have those that come out of your own spirit in the flesh. And we've had those along the way. We've had them. The prophecy came forth, thus saith the Lord, he's calling you to a ministry in Florida, and it will open. So the individual, instead of waiting for it to open, took off for Florida. I mean, if you get a prophecy, unless you get the plane ticket in the hand from the prophet, wait until God opens the way. But they took off for Florida back in three weeks, disillusioned. What ministry? You know, the first week, they're watching out the window, watching the mailbox, lying awake half the night for the Lord to speak to them like he did Samuel. Where is that ministry? It's coming. By the second week, well... <sighs> been kind of quiet last week. Then you do the sightseeing and sunbathing. By the third week, you're ready to come home, which she did. <laughs> or in another case where a woman to justify an unscriptural marriage that I counseled against tried to vindicate that unscriptural marriage by saying it's been prophesied that my husband and I would have a great ministry. Husband died. No ministry. So somebody, not necessarily false prophets, maybe they are, but prophesying out of their own spirit. Don't lay hands on people's head. Not in this church. Don't do it. When it's time for that to happen, why, God will cause it to happen. And again, without digressing, if the Holy Spirit tells you to go lay hands on Bob Jones's head or Mary Smith, and thus saith the Lord, then you mind the Lord because I'm not the Lord. And you can read enough books to know that he works that way. So there's no problem. We're just saying you have to be careful of what spirit you're yielding to. Amen. Yielding to the Holy Spirit is not a once-for-all experience. It's something you do day to day, is what we're saying. Now thirdly, for some further instruction on hindrances to moving into the deeper life, Maturity, spiritual maturity, is a matter of discipline. It's cultivating the spiritual life and not the fleshly life. Now here's where some will never make it because it's a matter of discipline. I mean that with all my heart. I'm trying to make it strong enough for you to understand that I may just be talking to you. You know, not necessarily point an individual, but you, each person. That maturity is a matter of discipline of your life. 
Galatians 5, 16, and 17, walk in the Spirit every day. Do you do that? Then you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, the lusts are not always some great, you know, orgy sort of thing. It's just letting the flesh have its way. Well, ho oh, ho, I'm too tired to study tonight. And Lord, you'll understand that this little genuflection on my knee was really a prayer from my heart. It only lasted 15 seconds, but I'm so... S you don't even get it said until you're off to dreamland. So it may be something like that's what I'm saying, that you let the flesh have its way. And then Colossians 3, 1 to 16. Set your affection on things above. Where's your affection? You know where it's at. Set your affection on things above and not on the earth beneath. Because he says your life is hidden God above. And then he gives the illustration of the old man, how we are to put off that sort of life, the fleshly life, and put on the new man with all of its righteous deeds. It's a matter of discipline. But the reason some do not go on to spiritual maturity, even with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is because they're often feeding the wrong dog. What's that? They're often feeding the wrong dog. You don't even own a dog. Yes, you do. I read somewhere of a minister who led some Indians to Christ, and this one Indian that he saw sometime later after his conversion, he said, how are things going? Well, he got right to the point, there seems to be within my heart two dogs, and they're fighting. One's a black dog and one's a white dog. It's like two dogs in my heart warring. One's a black dog, one's a white dog. The minister said, well, which one wins most of the time? He said, the one I feed. <laughs> so if you're not maturing the way you should or think you should, it may be you're feeding the wrong dog, the black one. You know what it means. It's because you're feeding the black one, giving in to your fleshly appetites, some former habit that you thought you were rid of. It may be yielding to anger that you haven't brought under control because you don't yield to the Spirit. Yielding to fleshly appetites of whatever nature they may be. Maybe you're feeding yourself on a TV dinner too often. Your TV appetite. We won't go into that, but you'll never grow in the Spirit watching one of those things. There's just an absolute built-in guarantee that you won't. You can go just so far. Now, some of you don't think you're addicted to it. I'll give you one test and you can prove it. Try to get rid of it. Hello? You'll find it's a spirit that has you bound. Try to get rid of it. You can't until you get delivered. And you don't want delivered. It's why you still have it. And I know where off I speak. I said I'd never have one in the house. So I got to watching news. I got to watching sports. First thing you know, I was watching to see what's going to happen in these other things. I said, it makes you sick to watch that junk. And so I quit watching it until next week. Yeah. I wouldn't have one in my house, but I went out to a motel every week just to rest. Work on electronics, you know, in a motel room. There's TV, big football game after football. Well, that's all of that, just football. First thing you know, it's my girl Friday or whatever. <laughs> and I saw it was a spirit, me bound with that thing. I couldn't believe it. And I couldn't give it up. It was just like an addiction. Oh, I did give it up, but I severed all relationship. It's like I gave up smoking. I didn't taper off. I didn't taper off with football games and sports and just the news. I just gave up the habit. And thank God I didn't stay addicted to it very long. 
And I think that the ministry ought to give serious consideration. This is not a legalistic church. You know that. But every member of the body ought to give serious consideration to dumping those things in the garbage. But certainly the ministry should. Just a pastorly word of advice. Ministers, don't get in the pulpit and use illustrations from television when you hear your pastor say over and over and over, it's garbage. It's not garbage. That's a good word. It's garbage. <laughs> you know, just common courtesy Amen. would say, I'm not going to use television as an illustration in my sermon because there's some sensitive ears out there that know that that's a snare of the devil. And when they hear you use an illustration, well, I only watch sports or news or whatever, you're not coming through to them with the rest of the message. That ought to be so obvious. They see you as a weak minister at that point. You don't have to debate it. Even the industry is concerned. Even the worldlings are concerned. It's so rotten. Well, let a word to the wise be a warning sufficient. If you can't go deeper with God than a TV set or a picture of Jesus, give up, you know, some of that religious garbage and whatever, then how can we really talk about being crucified with Christ and going deeper? These things are almost elemental. And you know I'm telling the truth. You know when you get into the area of that rot gut garbage that comes through that tube, it is so rotten you can't even get a news report that isn't biased against truth. So maybe you're feeding the black dog too much is what we're saying. So if you want to mature spiritually in the faith, you have to feed the right appetite, the spirit, on the word of God. Now, I wouldn't attempt to embarrass anyone here. So answer this to yourself. Of how many have even gotten themselves a copy of the deeper life in the Spirit? That it's home on their shelf. I didn't ask you to raise your hand. If you do, why, you're bragging. <laughs> but the question I want to ask how many of you have even read it through? I don't mean studied, read it through entirely once. Now, I hope, you know, if we ask for a show of hands that I would be not happily surprised, just happy because of the great response. But I'm also realistic. But compare what your answer was with the woman who wrote the letter and said, would you advise me whether or not you have a hardback edition of the Deeper Life in the Spirit book? Because I can't begin to tell you what a blessing this book has been to me. I've read it six times and expect to continue to do so, for each time I receive new blessings. I've recommended it to every Spirit-filled person I can. My first copy has completely come to pieces. She said, I've gone through it six times and it's literally in shreds. Now, just reading it six times wouldn't do that. But they're marked up. They're dog-eared. They're studied. Like another woman in a meeting where I was showed me her copy. And I mean to tell you, it had been through the mill. Not like it looked like it had been out in the rain, but dog-eared and well-worn. You know, had that healthy appearance that a book ought to have and said, I don't just read a book like this. I study them. Compare that with the man in Florida who had claimed healing of his eyes, you know, the great big deal, you know, something really important. And I'm not minimizing that it can be important. And it had been a little while. And he said, I don't understand why it isn't manifested yet. Well, I said, Really, there's no way to just say in a sentence why, but it is explained very carefully. In fact, we use that as an example in our faith book, Faith for Healing. Oh, he said, I've read that. Well, I said, I'm not talking about reading it. I'm talking about doing what it says. 
In fact, in the first chapter, I said, it tells you the answer to that question, why it isn't manifested yet. One of the reasons is he's asking why it isn't. Because one of the conditions to receive a promise from God is to hold fast to your confession of faith until it is manifested. Or compare the person who came to me wanting to go deeper with God, had no joy of the Lord, wanted to go deeper like she believed others of us are going deeper, and I believe we are. How do I do this? I've tried everything. Well, I said there are no shortcuts. And I'm going to tell you simply and plainly, it's in the Deeper Life in the Spirit book, 200 pages. But I can guarantee you, if you get into that, it'll work for you. There are all the plans and purposes and the hows and what not to do's and everything else. It's the most complete study that I know of on what the Spirit-led life is. And her reaction to me was like I said, your case is hopeless. Rather than saying, that's what it is. Praise the Lord. I'll just have to discipline myself. The reaction was totally negative. That isn't the first time that's happened. But there are no shortcuts to the deeper life. The deeper life is the crucified life. And a part of your crucifixion, it's not just getting on a literal cross, but it is to discipline yourself to a deep study of the Word. Not just reading daily Bible readings and off to your cooking pots or off to the garage or work. But a part of the crucifixion is that painful process. All we talk about enjoying the study of the Word, yes, you do if you've got all the time in the world and you can sit back if you have a week off or whatever. But that day-to-day -day study, that day-to-day -day communion, taking the time to commune, never being too busy. Because if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. And I don't mean just pray. I mean pray in the Spirit. So the deeper life is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you some of your time, that valuable time. It's going to require that you do what the deeper life book says. Now, of course, that's based on the Word. But that's to show you how to appropriate these things, like all of our books. It's not following a book, but the book of books. But you have to start doing what this woman did when she got her tongue lashing. She had just been studying on yielding. God will give you an opportunity for any section of the book. Just get in it when you go home and you can have your experience probably the next day <laughs> or before you go to bed. Yielding to the Spirit of God rather than yielding to your own spirit. It's going to cost you these things. You're going to have to die out to self. You're going to have to be willing to stop feeding that black dog and feed the white one. Now, the deeper life in the Spirit is a growth, as we show you in the book. It's not something that happens overnight any more than when you were born. You didn't go from one day to ten years in a day or two. It took ten years. A growth. Like when you planted your garden, you didn't reap of the harvest the next week. It took time. And so what some don't like to do is to wait while this growth process takes place to the extent we die out, His fullness is manifested in us and through us. But if you will do what the book says and do what the Word of God says, you will find you'll become increasingly aware that things are changing. It's not going to happen overnight, but you'll notice your attitude's different toward that situation. Where did that come from? It's because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Attitudes change. Speech changes. Just some things you won't say anymore. Confess. Habits, interests, desires, outlooks, goals. You may be out of the business you're in right tonight if you'll yield to the Holy Spirit within six months or a year. Just to use an illustration. And then in the fourth place, some are hindered in their growth to spiritual maturity. 
because they know the deeper life is the crucified life and that the crucified life is the cross and that the cross is death and who wants to die? They're hindered because they're putting it together. I know it's true, but why could it cost me everything? And because they're not willing to allow it to cost them everything, as Jesus says, then they resign themselves. And people in faith assembly have done this too, to a shallow Christian immaturity. They stop with salvation. They stop with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because they're not yielding to the Spirit on this question, they're out there already looking at the cost or what it might cost them, and so they never learn how to cope with Jesus, not suggestion, but command to forsake everything, to make absolute surrender. They don't know how to cope with that and their responsibilities to their family and their career. How can I surrender all, forsake all, and still meet these other responsibilities? And especially that strong word that Jesus gives in Luke 14, 26. You recall that? If any man come to me and hate, Jesus said it, hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, that's everybody except yourself. Yea, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, we've taught on that verse before, and we know that he also teaches you to love your wife or your husband or your children. So he's not going to contradict himself. And so, as we have shown you, that you're to hate any alternative choice to Jesus Christ. If you have to choose between wife or husband or a child, there's no hesitation. You choose Jesus. Because then you hate that. You hate that alternative. Because it's an alternative to Jesus. You ought literally to be able to say, I hate any alternative to Jesus, or I don't give you any hope. If you're saved, you're saved, and that's between you and God. But it's those who know right at this moment they'd give up everything for Jesus. Amen. What they hold most dear without a moment's hesitation. A wife of 50 years. Their children. Whatever. Now, do you know that? If you don't know that, then that's why you're being hindered in your spiritual maturity. Well, you may be thinking, if I'd only known that before I got married. Well, I love Jesus, but now I've got a family and I love them too. And now they can't cope with that surrender all, forsake all with these responsibilities? Or how do I love God with all of my heart, soul, and mind? What's left for anybody else? So if I'd known about this before I got married, I could see making Jesus the absolute object of my love, but I've got a family. I actually love those children, or the wife or the husband. How do I divide my love between them? Well, the answer I'll give is the answer that a woman a mother of ten children gave when she was asked, how do you divide your love among so many? She said, you don't divide, you multiply. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> now, any mother knows how that works. When you've got one, that's all of your love. You know, I'm talking about mother love. You get two, you don't love the first one any less, you just multiply your love and it embraces both of them. Three, when you got five, you've multiplied your love five times, on up to ten. And so if you'd quit trying to figure out how to do all of these seemingly impossible things that Jesus said we must do to enter the kingdom, and realize if he said you must do them that we can, if you'll do what he said, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you'd find your love is so great it encompasses the whole world. You can love your neighbor as yourself. Think of that. Your neighbor as yourself. 
You can love your family now with a true love. It's no longer possessive. I dare say that probably still a lot of your love is possessive. I love this object because it's mine. But you can love them with a self-giving love. And when they don't show any response to you later on in their teenage years, you don't say, well, I'll just stop loving you till you get your head on straight. But with the faith message, you can claim them. Self-giving love. They have a need, you meet the need. If you stop trying to figure out how to do it, you'll find out love doesn't divide up, it multiplies. Do what he said, give it all to God. And then you watch, it just embraces as God's heart does the whole world. You'll find you can move those mountains with a mustard seed of faith. Quit trying to figure out how much faith it takes to move a mountain. You'll find that you are going deeper in the Spirit. You'll find that Christ is beginning to live His life through you. That Galatians 2.20 is coming to pass. That in these situations where you used to manifest your Spirit, you yourself and others are seeing Christ. You'll find that you begin to walk in a spiritual realm that the average Christian, including charismatic, doesn't even know exists. That doesn't gender pride, but it's just a fact. Would you stand with me, praise God. Spirit of the sing it again and you don't have the threshold experience why don't you just ask for it if you want the laying on of hands you can receive it that way Spirit the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They'd have to, wouldn't they? How could you keep from wanting it? 
God is faithful. Let's praise Him. Praise Him. Hallelujah. Praise be to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, praise the Lord. 